Mariana Smith, the obstacle problem for the fractional Laplacian will be. Okay, thank you. Let me thank the organizers very much for the opportunity to come here. Last time I was in the colloquium was maybe 10 years ago. So it's very nice to come and give a talk. So this is joint work with Nicola Garofalo, Arshak Petrosian, and Camilia Pop. Uh, so if you haven't really seen obstacle problems before, uh, let me not start by the fractional one. So let me start with the classical obstacle problem. So the study of the classical obstacle problem began in the 60s with the pioneering works of Stampakia, Liouy, and Lyons. During the past five decades, it has led to beautiful developments in several areas of math, including calculus of variations and geometric PDEs. One of the crowning achievements of the theory of uh, the obstacle problem has been the development of the theory of free boundaries by Caffarelli. Nowadays, the obstacle problem continues to offer lots of challenges, and it's still being studied a lot, including variations of it. So also the thin obstacle problem, the fraction obstacle problem, parabolic obstacle problem. And over the past years, there has been some interesting progress in the obstacle problem for the fractional Laplacian, which is the one I'm going to focus on today. So I will present some new results about that and give you an overview about this problem. So let's start with the classical obstacle problem, which I can give you a picture of. So I'm kind of already hungry. I'm still in Europe time. So let's imagine we have some meatloaf, uh, and you want to cover it with a plastic wrap to put it back in the fridge so that it doesn't dry. So imagine that the plastic wrap is the graph of a function u. So this function u has to satisfy two properties. The first one is that, well, it has to be attached. The plastic has to be attached to the edge of the, your tray. So you have boundary conditions. And then, obviously, the plastic has to be on top of the food, right? So you have that your function u must be greater or equal than a certain given function phi, the obstacle. So that's why we say we have an obstacle problem. So the configuration of the plastic wrap after it adjusts to the geometry of the meatloaf represents the solution to the obstacle problem. So we look at all functions that satisfy these two conditions, and we want to minimize an energy among all of them. So mathematically, you're given a function phi of class C2 on the domain, which is the obstacle for us, the meatloaf. We have a function psi, let's say in W12, the Sobolev space, which is going to be our boundary values, and it has to satisfy a compatibility condition on the boundary. And we have a source term F in L infinity. And then we want to minimize this energy, so the gradient of U squared plus 2 times the source term times U over the set of functions in W12, so the Sobolev space, which coincide with psi on the boundary, so plastic wrap attached to the edge of the tray, and which are greater or equal than phi almost everywhere on the domain, so plastic on top of the obstacle. So you see that this is a closed convex set. This is not too complicated. There exists a unique minimizer. So let me give you a picture of this not involving food this time. So on the left, we do not have an obstacle. So all we have is the boundary condition. So if you have a function which has to have some boundary data, and on the right, we have besides the boundary data, the condition that you must stay on top of this other function here. So it changes the situation quite a lot. So we start with this minimization problem, but I work in PDEs, so I like PDEs. So you want to see what are the equations that the minimizer satisfies. And you prove that the Laplacian of the minimizer must coincide with the source term in the set where the minimizer is greater than the obstacle. And then on the set where they are the same, the Laplacian of the minimizer coincides with the Laplacian of the obstacle almost everywhere. So OK, good. You have these two equations. You can see right away, so let's imagine just to make our life simpler, that this source term is 0. So you already see that you should expect to have these continuities of the Laplacian. So you have a function which is harmonic on this set, but then its Laplacian coincides with this Laplacian on this set. So you should not expect the solution to be C2. Okay. And here you have two very important sets, which will be important in the case of the fractional Laplacian too. The first one is the coincidence set. So it's the set of points in the domain where the minimizer coincides with the obstacle. So the points where our meatloaf is touching the plastic. And then you look at the boundary of this set, and then you have the so-called free boundary. And on this talk, I'm going to talk about the regularity of the free boundary for the obstacle problem for the fractional Laplacian. Okay. 
So in this case of the classical obstacle problem, there are two very important questions you may ask yourself. The first one is, how smooth is the solution? So you start with a function which belongs to a Sobolev space. You want to see if it's actually better than that, and it is. The optimal regularity has been proved to be C11 lock, which is the same as W to infinity lock. And as I said, you should not expect uh, C2, for instance, and that's been proved. The second fundamental question is, how smooth is the free boundary? So in 77, Kinderlayer and Nuremberg proved that if you start by knowing that the free boundary is C1, then it's actually real analytic. So from C1 to real analytic. In the same year, Caffarelli developed his beautiful theory of the regularity of the free boundary, and he proved, first of all, that the free boundary is Lipschitz by uh, very, using very mild assumptions, and then he proved how to go from Lipschitz to C1 alpha. That means that with these two results, you go from Lipschitz to C1 alpha to real analyticity. So that problem was closed for the case of the classical obstacle problem. So you may ask yourself these two questions in lots of other kinds of free boundary problems, including the fractional Laplacian for the obstacle problem. So let me tell you about the fractional Laplacian, the obstacle problem for the fractional Laplacian, which is a bit more technical, but the ideas are the same. So you consider uh, this equation. So you're looking for functions that satisfy this. So you have an obstacle, which I'm going to call phi hat, and you want a function u hat which satisfies that the minimum between this operator and this is zero. Here, the operator L is denoting this operator. So it's the fractional Laplacian plus this drift term. So I have this uh, gradient perturbation. Uh, let me say one thing before. So if you have that this minimum must be zero, you can extract some things already. The first thing you know is, since this must be true, the function u hat must be greater or equal than phi hat always, so you have the obstacle. The second thing is that this operator must be greater or equal than zero. And finally, if the function is not touching the obstacle, so if u hat is greater than phi hat, the operator must vanish. So you already got some things out of this. If you're not very familiar with the fractional Laplacian, we saw on the first talk today the definition using the uh, Fourier transform. You can also define it in terms of this uh, singular integral. So if you pick a function psi, it's going to be up to a constant, the principal value of this integral. Um, if you prefer the definition with the Fourier transform, it's also the same, so don't worry. So we have, a, again, a problem which is an obstacle problem, but now we have this kind of trickier operator. So instead of having, like before, so let me put the, here we had the Laplacian, right? Now we have the fractional Laplacian, and we are adding this twist that we have these extra terms here, which actually create lots of problems. So the first fundamental question, as I mentioned, is what is the regularity of the solution? So I need to tell you a bit about the assumptions I'm making. So let's go back for a second. So I need to tell you what are my assumptions on the obstacle, on this term b, on this term c, and also on s, so the power of the fraction Laplacian. So we're going to assume that s is between a half and one. So you can define the fractional Laplacian for 0, 1. However, if S is between 0 and 1 half, that operator is not even elliptic. So the situation is completely different. You need completely different methods. And if you're interested, there is a paper by Camilla Pop and Epstein, which deals with the regularity of the solutions. In this case, which is the subcritical case, we call it, you can actually look at these terms, so the gradient perturbation, so this drift part, and you can deal with it as if it's a lower order term, and I'm going to show you how. And that has, allows us to use lots of methods from free boundary problems. I'm going to assume that B is CS, C is also in CS, and I'm going to assume it's positive, and I'm going to assume that the obstacle is in the class C3S and has compact support. Under these conditions, just this year, Petrosian and Pop proved existence of a solution in a holder space, they proved uniqueness, but then for this, they needed a little bit more on C, so they needed to assume it's bounded away from zero. And then they also had to assume that B is Lipschitz. And then they proved optimal regularity of the solution. So they proved that this solution, which exists, and in this case, which is unique, 
it's actually in C1s. So the first derivatives are holder with exponent s. So this is good. So they close the problem in this case regarding the regularity of the solution itself. So what we want to do is focus on the second fundamental problem, the regularity of the free boundary, which I'm going to define with this. So this is going to be, as in the case of the classic obstacle problem, the boundary of the set where the function coincides with the obstacle. And I'm going to prove regularity of a special subset of the free boundary, the so-called regular set. And I'm going to denote the regular set with this subscript 1 plus s here. And the reason why we, we do this is because the really fundamental property of the regular set is that if we pick a point on the free boundary, which is regular, and you do a rescaling of the function around this point, this rescaling is going to converge to a function which is a solution of the same problem and which is homogeneous of degree 1 plus s. This is not going to be the definition of the regular set, but something we will prove, okay? The re definition is a bit technical, so I don't want to write it down yet, but I want to give you the reason why we denote it with this. So informally, the way we're going to define the regular set is it's going to be the set of points on the free boundary where the limit of a frequency function of Almgram type attains its lowest, uh, smallest possible value. And using Almgram's frequency function is something extremely useful in free boundary problems. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. We use it very, uh, very frequently to work with optimal regularity of the solution. And that is what Camilla Pop and Arshak Petrosian did. So they defined a generalization of this Almgram frequency, which I'm going to show you. And then they show this function is monotone on decreasing and it's bounded, so it has a limit at zero. And they also proved that the limit at zero has to be something or greater or equal than something else. So you look at all points on the free boundary such that this limit is the smallest possible one. That's the regular set. So our main result is the C1 gamma regularity of the regular part of the free boundary. So under the assumptions I told you before for S in this interval, B here, C positive and CS, and this kind of obstacle, if we have a solution of our fractional obstacle problem with drift, and we have a point x0, which is regular, then, first of all, if you pick a small enough ball around this point x0 on the free boundary, if you look at any point on the free boundary inside of this ball, all points will be regular. So that means that the regular set is relatively open, first of all. So this is what this line is telling us. And moreover, in this small enough ball around x0, there exists a function g of class c1 gamma such that the free boundary there is the subgraph of G. So that is giving us the C1 gamma regularity of the free boundary, okay? So you can see that I'm kind of being dishonest since I didn't give the formal definition of the regular set yet, but this is what we want to do. So let me tell you a bit how we did that. So the big thing is since we have S between one half and one, we can deal with that uh, fractional, that, uh, sorry, gradient perturbation as a lower order term. So this is the first thing we do. So under the same assumptions as before, we assume that u hat is a solution of our problem with drift, and we consider w to be a solution of this. So the fractional Laplacian of w is those extra terms that I wanna get rid of, okay? Because we know that u hat is in C1s by the result of Petrosian and Pop, this is going to be in CS, this is by assumption in CS, this is in CS, therefore you can prove that W is in C3S. And actually that's the best you can do. Now you define U to be U hat minus W and phi to be phi hat minus W. And the reason why you do that, because now you're going to have an obstacle problem without drift, so you got rid of the problem. So this function U is now going to satisfy this problem here. So the minimum between the fractional Laplacian of u and u minus phi has to be zero. But of course, doing this comes with a cost. And the cost is you have a very, very bad obstacle now. So phi, even if phi hat to begin with was very nice. So let's say we started our problem with a phi hat, which was very smooth. Now we would have a phi, which is only in C3s, no matter what. So you have a better problem to solve with a worse obstacle, okay? As before, 
this equation is telling us that u must be greater or equal than phi, so you have the obstacle phi. You have that the fractional Laplacian of u must be greater or equal than zero, and you have that if u is not equal to phi, the fractional Laplacian must vanish. So you got something out of this. You also can notice that if you define the free boundary of u as the boundary of the set where u now coincides with the new obstacle phi, this is the same as the free boundary for u hat, just by these definitions, since we have the minus w on both of them. And I haven't given you the precise definition yet, but we will define the regular set of u in such a way that these two coincide. So they will be the same by definition, okay? So that means that if I can prove that this set is now C1 gamma, this one will be. So we're good. So instead of working with the complicated problem with this term, I'm going to work just with the fractional Laplacian, but with a very, very unfortunately bad obstacle in C3S, okay? So our main result actually will be if we have S on this interval and an obstacle in C3S, if we have a solution U, so I don't have the hats anymore, that means I have an obstacle without the drift. If we have a solution of this problem and a point on the free boundary for U, which is regular, then again, the regular part of the free boundary for U is relatively open, and that guy is the subgraph of a function in C1 gamma. If this result holds for the fractional Laplacian without drift, we recover the same result for the fractional Laplacian with drift, since the regular sets are the same. Okay. Okay, so this is our main goal. Uh, what has been done about this problem before? So in 2008, Caffarelli, Sauce, and Silvestri, they worked with the case of no drift, so they did not have that, uh, those extra terms to begin with, and they did prove C1 gamma regularity of the regular set, assuming that the obstacle is in C21. So what we wanted to do is work with the drift case, and for that, we ended up with a without drift case, but with a very poor obstacle. So we proved this result under these conditions. Okay. okay. Now, let me tell you how we deal with the fractional Laplacian in many cases, so not only on this problem. The idea is the fractional Laplacian is tricky to work with because it's a non-local problem. So you want to localize it. And to localize it, we define this degenerate elliptic uh, operator, LA. And A is given by this, 1 minus 2S. And this operator is defined in the following way. So if you have a function V, which is of class C2 on Rn cross R plus, so I'm adding a dimension, which I did not have before. So this operator gives you the divergence of y to the a grad v. And why the heck am I looking at this, right? So I had a very different problem before. However, they are deeply connected, the fractional Laplacian and this operator la. So if you have a function w whose operator la vanishes there, then actually, if you compute this limit, so y to the a, and then you have the y derivative of w at the point x, y, as y goes to zero, where y is this extra dimension we didn't have before, then you recover the fractional Laplacian of w at x0. So this means that the fractional Laplacian is a Dirichlet to Neumann map for this operator. And now we might have an advantage working with this because this will be a local problem. So if we can rewrite our problem, which we had in terms of the fractional Laplacian, in terms of this operator, it might actually be much better for us. And that's what we do. To do that, we first have to uh, do an extension of our problem. So we're going to add an extra dimension there. So this is following something that uh, Caffarelli and Silvestri did, so they did this extension. So we had a function u and phi, so the function and the minimizer for the case of non-drift, and we do extensions of them uh, in such a way that these new functions, which I'm still denot denoting with u and phi, they are LA harmonic. And now we define this function vx0, because I'm looking around the point x0 on the free boundary, which is the extension of u minus the extension of the obstacle minus something. And the reason why I have to do that is because I want to have a new function vx0 such that when I compute the operator la, this is going to vanish on a good portion of rn plus 1, okay? So if I define this new function vx0, so it's defined this way, I'm going to have that this guy now, the operator LA, 
vanishes on Rn except on R cross 0. This function Vx0 is greater or equal than 0 on Rn cross 0. This is easy to see because if y0, this term is not there. And then u is greater or equal than phi since phi was the obstacle to begin with. And then you have these two conditions here which are telling us that this operator has, contains a singular measure on the set y equals 0 minus vx0 equals 0. So it's a bit delicate, but we have expressions which we can work with. And there is this term hx0 here, which is defined this way, so it's a function depending on the fractional Laplacian of the obstacle. And we have actually very nice uh, bounds for this new function vx0 and also for hx0, so they are bounded in this way. So while this looks pretty complicated, this is a local problem now, and we're going to forget what we had before, and we're going to work with functions which satisfy these equations. Okay? So uh, I told you about the regular set, but I haven't really defined it yet, so it's time that I face this problem. So let me tell you what Petrosian and Pop did. So they used the new monotonistic formula to establish the optimal C1S regularity, assuming that we had those conditions, the same, as, same ones as before. And the new monotonicity formula that they established is a new version of Almgren's frequency function. So what the heck is Almgren's frequency function? So in 79, Almgren uh, showed that if you have a function which is harmonic, an honest harmonic function in the unit ball, then the frequency of u, which is a function of one variable, it's a function of r, the radius, this function is going to be monotone non-decreasing. And this function is what? So we multiply the Dirichlet integral by r and divide by this, which we call a height function. And really what I think is mind-blowing is that besides this being monotone non-decreasing, this function is going to be constant equal to kappa, let's say, if and only if our harmonic function is homogeneous of degree kappa. So now you're relating a very, very interesting property of a harmonic function with this function of one variable being constant. And this relationship between these two things has been used many times when you're dealing with obstacle problems, free boundary problems, and it's a very, very powerful tool to prove optimal regularity. So what Petrosian and Pop did was define a generalization of this formula, which is on the next slide, and you don't have to worry with the formula because it does look much more complicated, but it is a generalization of this. And then with that, they were able to prove this C1S regularity. And let me show you. So recall that we had, to localize our problem, we defined these extensions, and then we subtracted this term. So this is the function Vx0. They proved that in that interval for s between 1 half and 1, and now for alpha between 1 half and s. If you have a point on the free boundary, then for any p in a certain interval, don't worry about the technical details, it really does not matter. Then if you multiply this function here, which truly looks pretty ugly, but it's a generalization of Almgrim's, if you multiply this by this factor here, you have a function which is monotone on decreasing, and that is what you need. Moreover, so because this guy is monotone non-decreasing and it's bounded, it has a limit at zero. Now we're golden. They also proved that the limit at zero has to be n plus three, n plus three plus two times p minus s, or greater or equal than something. So that means that the points whose limit at zero are n plus three, the lowest possible one, are pretty special. And these are the ones who are going to be the regular points. So we define finally the regular points for u. So a point on the free boundary for u is called regular if this limit at zero is n plus three for any p on this interval. There was that, that function depended on p. And then we write the set of regular points as the set on the free boundary such that the limit is the smallest possible for any p. Okay? Now there is a question you might ask yourself pretty quickly is, uh, what if the limit is this for 1p? Is it always n plus 3 for any p? And yes, it is. So if you pick a point on the free boundary, if for 1p that limit is n plus 3, then the limit is n plus 3 for any p. Therefore, you just have to check for 1. 
okay, we're pretty good. Now we can define the regular points for u hat, so our solution of the obstacle problem with drift. So we say that x0 is going to be regular if x0 is a point which is regular for u. That's trivial. So we're defining them to be the same set. So our result is basically proving that this regular set for u is locally a C1 gamma regular surface, and as a consequence, the same holds for u hat. Our central results are, first of all, a new vice type monotonicity formula and a new epipermetric inequality. So both inspired by the results obtained by Georg Weiss, who was here and gave a talk yesterday, one of the plenary talks, for the classical obstacle problem. So before I give you a little bit of the ideas of what we did, let me tell you that I'm going to need these two spaces, not really much, but just if you see them written, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to have this uh, holder spaces with a weight A, and that means that I have this Y to the A weight on the Y derivative only. And then I'm going to have this weighted Sobolev spaces, which means I'm going to have this Y to the A here on the integral. But that's all. Don't worry about it. So let me tell you about the outline of our approach. So the first main ingredient, as I mentioned, is this almost monotonicity of a vice type functional. So intuitively, this is going to measure the closeness of our function v, which I define as like uh, you do the extensions and subtract that extra term. So how close that function is going to be to a prototypical homogeneous solution of degree 1 plus s. And this is the prototypical homogeneous solution. Looks ugly, but whatever. There is an explicit formula. And the reason why we do that is because, like I told you, the regular points are the points that, when you do these rescalings, they are going to converge to a function homogeneous of degree 1 plus s. So hopefully, they are going to be this function, the limit, up to a rotation and a multiple. So that's why we need to measure how close these rescalings are to this guy. And for that, we have the vice type function. So the second main ingredient then is going to be what we call an epiperimetric inequality, which is going to be applied to the vice functional, which we are going to define here, but it's going to be defined for a simpler case. So instead of having that function h x zero on the local equations, that is going to be zero. And I'm going to apply this when the radius is one. You see. So it's just a simpler case. And the combination of these two results, this and this, is going to give us a geometric rate of decay for the vice functional, which is really the most crucial thing we need to study these homogeneous blow-ups, so these guys. So I'm defining these guys around zero in this case, and these are the guys that are going to converge to a solution homogeneous of degree one plus s. And that is what's going to give us the C1 gamma regularity. Okay, okay so let me give you a little bit more detail. So given a point x0, regular, our goals will be to prove that these homogeneous rescalings, so now I'm doing them around x0, are going to converge to a unique solution of the local problem, so that's point 3, so the one with the operator LA, with h x0 substituted by 0, so it's a simpler problem, and it's going to be homogeneous of degree 1 plus s. That's the first goal. Then we want to actually write, because it's going to be a homogeneous function, so this blow-up limit has to be up to a multiple and a rotation, that function I had on the previous slide. So it's going to look something like this. That's all that this means. It's a multiple and a rotation of the prototypical solution. And here, this e x0 is going to be a unit vector. Moreover, you want to prove, and that is non-trivial, that this factor here is not zero, so that the blow-up is non-zero. Once you have this, so you know that the blow-up around the point x0 has this form for any point x0 which is regular, you can actually look at the functions that for each x0 give you the factor a x0, and that for each x0 give you e x0. And you want to see that these functions are actually holder continuous. That is the crucial point to prove regularity of the free boundary. And once you know that they have this expression, we're almost there. So to prove the C1 gamma regularity, we need to prove that these functions are holder, like this. And really, the crucial step to prove this is this inequality here. So this is what I'm calling the blow-up. So it's the limit of the rescalings. So you compare the limit of the rescalings for two points, x bar and y bar, 
in a neighborhood around a fixed point on the free boundary, which is regular, and you have an inequality like this. If you have this, you remember that these guys are written like this, and once you have that, you recover this inequality. So this is truly, truly the crucial and hard part, this one. So let me tell you about the first main ingredient, which I mentioned is this Weiss monotonicity formula. I'm not going to enter into lots of details just for you to have a flavor. So we define this Weiss functional to be a function of one variable also. So it's a function of R, and it's defined in this way. Looks a bit ugly, but it's actually quite natural. And if you have a function which is homogeneous of degree 1 plus s, and it's a solution of your problem, the local problem, this is going to vanish. So it's, it's pretty natural. The result we proved is that if you have a point which is regular on the free boundary of u, then if you add the vice functional to a factor like this, and this factor is pretty nice and not problematic because it's going to zero as r goes to zero, this guy, the derivative of this guy, is bounded by this quantity. And that is great because what we are going to do is, oh, first of all, you can say that because this is bounded away from, so it's greater or equal than zero, this is monotone on decreasing. Therefore, again, this guy has a limit at zero, which is very important. And the second thing is, the way that we're going to apply this result is by integrating this inequality on both sides, doing a kind of like calculus one change of variables. And then when you do that, you recover here the rescalings, this vx zero r, you let r go to zero, and then you recover the blow up. On the left hand side, you're going to have zero. On the right hand side, you're going to have this for the blow up limit. So that means that this has to be zero. So the blow up limit has to be homogeneous of degree one plus s. So that's how you use it. And this is what's written here. So we recall the definition of the homogeneous rescalings and the, the convergence to blow ups using the vice uh, functional is this. So assume that the point in question on the free boundary is zero. We prove that these guys converge up to a subsequence to a function v0 in this space. So I have this holder space with the weight. v0 is going to satisfy the local equations, but instead of having hx0, I'm going to have zero. So it's a simpler equation. And which is truly important, v0 is going to be homogeneous of degree one plus s. So this all comes from this simple application of the vice monotonicity formula. Unfortunately, we still don't have uniqueness of the blow-ups. We still don't know that V0 is not zero, and we don't have a rate of convergence. So all of that we need, and for that we need the epiparametric inequality. So the second main result is this epiparametric inequality. So I told you uh, a few times about this prototypical solution. Let me give it a name now. So I'm going to call it V0 hat. So that's the prototypical solution of the uh, homogeneous of degree one plus s. So when h of x zero is zero and the radius is one, the vice functional, which I define here, oh, here, so this is going to vanish, all the radius are going to be one. Okay, so that's all I'm doing. So the vice functional has this simpler shape here. And since the blow up uh, the rescalings are going to converge to a solution which satisfies our problem. In this case, this is what we need to look at. And what we did is prove that if you have a function in the Sobolev space with the weight, which is homogeneous of degree one plus s, which is greater or equal than zero on the ball in Rn, that's why I have this B1 prime, and which is close enough to this prototypical solution, which is going to happen for us because we're looking at regular points, so if you're close enough to this guy, then you can come up with another function zeta with the same boundary, which is also greater or equal than zero on the ball in Rn, but now whose vice functional is smaller, and it's smaller in a controlled fashion with this universal constant kappa. And this is really important because if you remember, I wanted to obtain this geometric rate of decay for the vice functional. It's going to come from here. So once you have this, uh, the first thing you do is the following. So if you remember, we wanted to obtain an estimate for this uh, blow up at the point X bar minus the blow up at the point Y bar. But you start simpler because that's too complicated to start with. So you fix a point on the free boundary, let's say it's zero, 
and I just want to estimate something around zero, so for rescalings around zero. That's the first step. So this lemma says that if there exists S0 and R0, such that if you look at this rescaling and you extend it to the whole ball, the unit ball, as a homogeneous function of degree one plus S, let's call it WR, so assume that these guys are close enough to the prototypical solution. So there is a little lemma there, which is to prove that this works, but it does because we have a regular point. So if these guys are close enough to this prototypical solution V0 hat, then the, v, the rescaling VT minus VS, where these are the rescalings, they are going to go to zero in a very controlled way with this universal exponent gamma, okay? So this is done around zero, so it's all rescalings around the same point. The main ingredient in this proof is the fact that we have this geometric rate of decay for the vice functional, which in turn comes from the epiparametric inequality. The next step then is to look at a point, a general point x0, and look at points close enough to x0. So let's assume that x0 is regular. These were the homogeneous rescalings around x0. The proposition we prove, first of all, finally, is to prove that the regular set is relatively open. So in this small enough neighborhood around x0, all points on the free boundary are also going to be regular. And then we prove that if you pick a point x bar on this small enough neighborhood, and if this guy is a blow up around that point, then now you can compare the rescalings with the blow up limit in terms of the same universal power. And this works for any x bar on this small enough neighborhood. And now this is really nice because first thing, you get that the blow up limit is unique. That's the first thing you get. And actually we get a bit more. Now we get that ugly expression for the blow up limits. So you can prove that it's up to a multiple and a rotation, the prototypical solution. And finally, and this is not trivial even now, you can prove that the blow up limit is non-zero. So this guy, AX bar, cannot be zero. Once you have that, you have the extra, the final, really final step. So assume that X0 is a regular point for you. There exists this small enough neighborhood around X0, this guy, such that if you pick any two points there, X bar and Y bar, you can compare the blow up at the X bar with the blow up at Y bar in terms of X bar minus Y bar to the same universal power. So once you have that, now you're good. So then we recover this uh, theorem for u, and then we recover the theorem for u hat. So this we did, again, only for the interval 1 half and 1, because for 0, 1 half, things are totally different, assuming b is in cs, c is in cs positive, and the obstacle is in this class. So then the set of regular points is relatively open, and it's actually the graph of a function in c1 gamma. So that's the final result. Thank you.